Good evening. Welcome to Inside the Improviser Studio. Our guest tonight has performed, caught, uh, caught uh, for the White Sox for uh, three years. Uh, hit 222 and was sent back to the minors. He performed, coached, and taught at the Improv Olympic for the past seven years. Formerly as a member of the house team Frank Booth. Thank you. Currently as a cast member of the Armando Diaz Experience. He's the director of the Improv Olympics touring group, The Road Show, and certainly one of the nicest guys you would ever hope to meet in the world of improv. <laughs> Please welcome Paul Grandi. <laughs> Spend the night together with Paul. <laughs> you grew up in Westmont, Illinois. Westmont, Illinois, 25 miles west of Chicago. I uh, went to uh, wait, Hinsdale. Hinsdale Township High School Central. Red <laughs> Devils. Go Red. Go Red. How did you first get involved in theater? Uh, okay, we'll start there. Um, <laughs> Actually, my first play, I was in the uh, fourth grade, and we did a uh, live stage version of The Giving Tree. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I played the boy, and I, uh, I got to uh, age throughout the thing with glasses, and like, a cane, and a, like a, a, a cardigan, and that kind of thing. And, uh, I got to, my friends played the tree, and I got to like, remember sitting on uh, the stump, of course, Later on, as the man is old, and I was sitting at uh, Susanna Rosales. Case you can see her again. I don't think she went into acting, but um, <laughs> uh, I remember feeling kind of just kind of proud of myself, feeling very good that I got to sort of like be popular for that time. Because basically, I'm kind of a quiet guy, but uh, my name was pulled out of a hat to play the boy. I didn't have to audition, well. <laughs> so it was just lucky. Um, and then how about high school? I, uh, the first thing, I, uh, no one from my grade school... We'll need a, uh, an ashtray up here, Jason. Oh, sorry. Too sweet. <laughs> uh, um, I was, uh, the only people who came to my high school from my grade school was my, uh, twin sister, Jennifer, and another friend of hers named Terry Morgan, so I walked into high school without knowing anyone. And, uh, if you're... If you know about Hinsdale Central, you know about Hinsdale, it's a very affluent suburb of Chicago and basically a bunch of rich little snot kids and stuff. So they didn't like me and I didn't talk to anybody. And, uh, but, uh, thanks Jason. But I uh, found a couple of cool people next to me in English class and we were farting around one day and I got a detention um, from our teacher before the end of the school day. And uh, the detention was to be served in the auditorium of the school. Uh, and while we were sitting there, the, uh, our, the our theater department was doing uh, plays and stuff, and they were rehearsing Death of a Salesman. Uh, and I remember sitting there, and uh, they were like, the set was half finished, and they were up there doing their, doing their Arthur Miller and stuff, and it, people were like, the rest of the cast was sitting in the front row of seats, you know, we were kind of near the back. And uh, some people were laughing, but they were doing work, and the, there was an air, you know, the smell of sawdust was in the air. And stuff. <laughs> um, and I was sitting there on the chest and just watching the whole thing. I said, wow, they're up there acting and rehearsing the spite scenes. Spite, spite, spite! And everyone's getting excited and stuff. And uh, I'm really digging it. And then one of the cast members, uh, or one of the people in the play, came over and started just like bullshitting with the, like the ten students who had attention from Mary Walsh's English classes. We were all sitting there and uh, uh, he came over and started like doing bits like, hey, what's going on? And I'm like, wow, this guy is so cool. Uh, he's so easy with us and he doesn't know us. And his manner is so suave. And those guys up there, you know, just being different people and stuff. Uh, so that was, that had a huge effect on me. Um, one of the guys, I had detention with wasn't in that production, but he uh, did audition for it and didn't get it. 
So the next play to come up, he convinced me to audition as well. So I went and got a monologue book, of course, and found one from a play called Silent Night, Lonely Night. Anyone ever hear of that? No. Woo! You know, some, some guy like trying to get back together with his wife in a phone booth, and you know, I'm 13 years old. Because <laughs> I have a late birthday in the new year and stuff. So. <laughs> school and, and I guess when I got nervous I couldn't pronounce my R's. Uh, I went to speech therapy and you know grade school and stuff and uh, and I'm sure I was just all in all over the place and uh, I, I I was so nervous and scared. Uh, I assumed I didn't get in but the director of it uh, like sort of made up a walk on part for me and he and he let me in. Uh, which, was, which was very nice. And the play was the play was one floor over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> Walk in McMurphy when he was, you know, all anonymized and pull out the dancing guy and Scanlon when he was, you know, fuck him all and I would pull him out and stuff like that. But again, uh, I didn't know anyone in the cast and they were all over so no one talked to me. And I'm not the most engaging person, sort of like, hi, I'm Paul Cardi. So basically, I kind of like admired the seniors in it and I just kept it's to myself. adventurous. Uh, high school theater department. You did like and, uh, yeah, we did Echoes. We did Echoes in tribute in repertory. We uh, we did Man we did the Manimal Mantra, Full Scale Street Kind of Desire, which I guess a lot of students do. But yeah, I mean, we did Echoes, and I think we got into uh, there was a little bit of you know confrontation between the principal and our director about doing it, but we got to do it, and I played a horse. We had these we rented these beautiful. <laughs> these beautiful, like, wicker, you know, woven, like, uh, horse heads to wear on top of our head. And we made these, oh, these shoes, I should have mentioned that. We, the, metal, the, uh, the freaks, the metal shop kids, they, uh, <laughs> we gave them, what we call them, you know, just another time to that. Uh, we gave them horseshoes, and we told them to make platforms out of them. So they made these horseshoes into eight foot high metal platforms that we wore out, strapped onto our feet with duct tape. So we were, you know, we were about, we were really tall and the heads, you know, sat on top of our heads, so we were very imposing. It looked pretty cool. Um, and it was, and it was dirty and we were all excited about that too. It was, it was like, I put it in there, I put it in there, it's great. And you did do a little bit of improv at some point in high school, right? Yeah, uh, that same English teacher who gave me detention after I'd been in the theater for a couple of years, we had an acting class in, at our high school that we could take as an elective. And I think I was a junior or something like that. So we'd go through acting and do monologues or scenes or whatever. And every Friday we could play uh, Happy Dale Sanitarium, where we'd all be in a waiting room of a sanitarium where crazies hang out. And uh, we were able to just improvise, just straight improvise. Uh, our, the teacher, Mary Walsh, gave a note saying once that, uh, you know, you could do anything here. I mean, why had one student come in with a machine gun and blow everyone down with a gun? And, uh, you can do that, and everyone has to die, and I thought that was great, and I tried it, and no, and like three people died, and three people didn't sell it. <laughs> just, just like now, just like today. You know. <laughs> <laughs> shoot someone, they don't go down, and it's the same thing as a sub junior in high school. Yeah. So after high school, you were accepted into the uh, theater problem at the theater program. <laughs> yeah, after Paul. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, did, I, I was a C student in high school. I, Bad. I probably could have been better, but I just didn't didn't care enough, I guess, or didn't realize the importance of it. <laughs> um, so I kind of went into theater because I mean, a I loved it, but b you don't have to be a brainiac to be an actor. Um, it helps, but uh, you don't have to be. So uh, and DePaul was close. Our family didn't have a lot of money, so I knew I had to go close by. And I auditioned for DePaul, and I got in. It was just felt just great. And um, I started there in the fall of 96, 86, 86, yeah, and, uh... Three years ago, after you got out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> now. Went to Europe. <laughs> uh, and I started at DePaul University, and once again, uh, I'm in a situation where I don't know a single soul, and I, I just shut up. I just, quiet and listen and learn and stuff like that. I was a commuting student 
So I rode the train in every day, and uh, I didn't get to hang out with everyone who lived in the dorms, and they were all clicking off here and there. And, uh, I had a couple nice friends, a couple guy friends. Uh, so I clung to them very, very, very tightly uh, as I was going through my first year there. Where did you get out of the theater program there? Uh, the theater program there, I, I, what it did was more than teach me anything about acting, it taught me more about myself and how, how me, Paul Brownie, is okay to be just me. Uh, I don't have to worry about making sure that I believe what other people believe or I laugh at whatever they laugh at. Uh, it taught me to be secure with myself and it also opened me up uh, emotionally and uh, sort of opinion-wise. Uh, coming from Hinsdale where uh, a lot of the kids were rich and they got everything they wanted to so they were very close-minded about whatever ethnic ethnicity or politics or it was very conservative for and I hung out with a conservative bunch, and I kind of like pigeonholed myself to be like them. Uh, it didn't hurt or anything because I didn't formulate my own views, but my views were whoever was around me at the time. Uh, and the first year at school, I realized how important my own choices were and my own opinions. Um, I think I I was 17 years old. I think by the end of my first year there, I was like 22 or 23. I mean, I had matured that first year and uh, had basically sort of like been the same sort of person a little bit ever since that first year. So they cut down the group after each year and after your sophomore year you didn't get picked up uh, yes. for, uh, for the next year. I was not asked back to be in the casting pool at the theater school, which is fine. It saved me about, you know, 22 grand. Um, <laughs> and I'm doing fine. Uh, one thing, the, my acting teacher there, Don, uh, Don Oko, was uh, a huge uh, supporter of me and someone that I admired very much. He was, he was the first homosexual I'd ever met. Um, and he was, uh, he was- That you knew of. That I knew of, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you deliver your paper, the <laughs> Very helpful after I got after I got uh, like kicked out or whatever, told that I wasn't good uh, to make sure coming that I that I was good and that uh, I did achieve you know good acting stuff, but I didn't do it the way DePaul taught it, so that was part of the reason why I was kicked out. I I never went to my faculty advisor. Uh, I just didn't like bother. I, you know I don't know. It, it didn't. Uh, I don't want to go to someone I don't know and go, hi, I'm Paul Grant. I don't want to do that. So I had to do that, and I just wanted to avoid it, so I avoided it. And I guess that could have helped. I don't know. But I, I, got, out, I got out of DePaul what I, what I needed, and that was, that was confidence and a, and a secureness about myself and who I am. So you worked in retail for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I go over this real quick. Blockbuster, Brookstone, uh, Proxy Brentano's, uh, Accent Chicago. You've seen my earlier work in improv, you know I refer to that. What's the uh, Sunglasses place? Uh, Sunglass Hut. <laughs> which I did commit a small amount of payroll fraud at. <laughs> Uh, uh, but after uh, a couple of years after uh, stopping your uh, classes at DePaul, you got hooked on Second City. What, yeah. Who were the performers at the time that you would go see? And... Uh, when I was going to see Second City, it was basically <coughs> Farley's first time on main stage. It's all kind of blurry because I don't remember like titles and stuff. I remember Tim Meadows was in the cast the first time I saw it, and I believe Joe List still was. Um, I might be mixing years because I. Was the cast of Steve Lacey? Yeah, is that the first one? Um, and I, I loved I, I loved being down in the city when I was when we, we would go down here in high school to see Stop Making Sense and a bunch, and we would uh, occasionally go down and see plays. We did a version of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead in my high school, and they were doing it downtown, so we went to go see that. Couldn't get in, went to go see Amadeus, and now that's a great movie. I love that movie. Basically, I saw it downtown first off. Um, what were we talking about? Craig? Second city, so right. you uh, So, I decided then and there. Yes, I, uh, I love Second City. I, uh, 
I wanted to be on that stage. That was my goal. I took a matchbook home and I actually stuck it in my mirror in my bedroom. Second City, red matchbooks. It's, it was there for a long, long time. And, uh, it was either that or stalk at Murray Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to, yeah. Uh, so I was, I moved home after, after DePaul University and retailed for a while. I uh, didn't save any money, but I started taking classes at Second City Northwest out in Rolling Meadows. Yes. When you signed up, you thought you were signing up for Players Workshop? Yeah, I assumed it would be downtown, because that was the one I heard about. Um, but then they called me back for a class Sunday, 3 to 6, out in Rolling Meadows to give me directions. I'm like, oh, fuck, yes, I do. Rolling Meadows. And I think the person on the phone said, yeah, we call it Rolling Ghettos. And I'm like, oh, that makes me feel great. Um, so yeah, I ended up going out to Rolling Meadows every, uh, Every Sunday, listening to uh, Dick Buckley's jazz on the way there. <laughs> and whenever I hear him, I still think about driving up Route 83 to 53 and getting up to Woodfield. And you still owe the money? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I basically abused the hell out of the payment plan that they had there, which was like two $75 sums. I believe I still owe $75 to Cheryl Sloan. And the church is still known about it. <laughs> why I'm not in Second City right now. <laughs> <laughs> because of the $75 plan, not it. Okay. What were your classes like there? Uh, they were okay. We, uh, we went around the room the first day, and everyone said, why are you there? I want to learn how to talk in public. My friends tell me I'm funny. I want to be more assertive. And then finally, just to me, it's like, I want to be a professional actor and do improv for the rest of my life. <laughs> Sunday, uh, our instructor was Jimmy Doyle, if you know him. Um, I had him for three of my five levels. If you know Jimmy. So, yeah, you'll start laughing if you know who Jimmy Doyle is. Uh, and basically, we would sit in the back and we would smoke. And uh, I had a theater background, so all the exercises were very, uh, were, uh, very reminiscent of what I was doing. So I had no problem with it. But there were the guys in the class going, what the, what the, this is, you know, they totally blowing off everything. And, and what was this? No, like, <laughs> uh, Jimmy would uh, have us uh, miming as a warm up, we would like pump water. Yeah. And we would give weight to the object, just crack this object, work a little bit of that. Um, and I'm coming, I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. I see it, I feel it, um, I smell it. Uh, and everyone else is like, what, what the hell? Um, cats all backwards. <laughs> and, uh, and then we would learn, uh, we would learn game improv. We would learn game after game after game. And uh, I, you know, I, I took to it. When I was going to school, I was incredibly scared of improv. And I couldn't do it. We did some improv at the theater school, but I, uh, I mostly avoided it. I remember doing one good improv scene where I was making cookies, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I was so I was very scared of it. But for some reason, actually, Jimmy uh, was basically the second homosexual that I had as a teacher. Um, uh, I, I, I sort of we sort of had like a like a bond. Like he knew I was into it on uh, more of a serious level than everyone else, so we could like sit back and be like <laughs> Vince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, so I mean I was tops in the class, but oh, the pun was like a thimble. So it didn't <laughs> uh, meanwhile, like on Saturdays or whatever, uh, Dassey, Liz Allen, Kelly Bruna, and like Ed Dassey and all these great improvisers are like being are being asked to do best of Second City shows. And if I had signed up for Saturdays, I would have been with you guys and there would have been Jake, but uh, I was stuck with the housewives and frat guys. <laughs> and they retarded me, I swear to God. <laughs> you did make one uh, mistake in uh, Jim Zolder's class. I had just fixed <laughs> I'd seen a Second City show, like, at least a year, I thought longer before I started taking class. And there was this Tim Meadows blackout, and I, uh, I'll explain it, because I think it's pretty funny. He's sitting there in a car with his wife, and you hear, boo! You know, 
cop comes up to the side. He's walking slowly and Tim's in the car like, oh man, god damn, god damn, fucking pig. And he says that just as the cop's right there, the cop says, what do you say? And she goes, oh, I'm talking to my wife. And I got And I did that exact scene, scene. Like, improv scene. <laughs> Not only that anyone in Second City had ever seen any of their own shows. <laughs>
Uh, cover your Sharna. I learned more from Sharna in eight weeks than I did the whole year in Second City Northwest. <laughs> oh. About uh, certainly about how to improvise, you know, one on one, sustain fake scene work for for an extended period of time. Mm. Uh, in my class were uh, Kelly Rudis, Steve Mosqueda, these names you don't know, some of you do. Um, Rich Del Rico. Rich Del Rico, Stu Harris, uh, I think Dave Swap and Jim Stone. <laughs> those, those, those are like joke names. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're like the... Okay, so then you, <laughs> then you got put on a team with all these guys. Yeah, and then I got put on a team called Mr. Pink. Uh, I think if you were listening to Dassey, back when we started, the uh, new teams were all named after Reservoir Dogs kind of thing. Um, and I was put on Mr. Pink with the people, thank God, that I had in class. I, I'm starting something new with people that I know for one of the first times in my life. Uh, so uh, this girl, Arden, who uh, left I.O. pretty soon, was put on. She somehow got in touch with you, Craig, and Craig became our coach. Like, uh, your first team or no? Yeah, it was the first, in the interest of full disclosure, I was the coach of the team. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, isn't it funny that I'm here now? It is funny. <laughs> and you're older than me. <laughs> um, I was, I was, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, well, I mean, you were, yeah, you were doing the right thing. Um, plus, and, and we were too as a team. Uh, the air around I.O. was you, you, got, you were fighting for basically one, two slots a week, or one slot a week. Thursday night slot, well, two teams on Thursday nights, and then you had a, a Friday early slot? There, no, there was three shows a week. Right. Saturday night was a family doing three-man rituals, so there was right. basically four chances yeah. to yeah. play a, a week. Right, and they had like nine teams to play yeah. that to start off. The first game we had nine teams, and uh, and we wanted to improvise. It was the only place to improvise in Chicago. Uh, I mean, the only places to improvise were the class, the Second City and Owens class and I.O. classes. Uh, so we were lucky. We got a bunch of people on our first team, excuse me, who wanted to be the family wanted to take that slot, uh, and nothing would stop us. Um, we, had, uh, we had that competition in mind. You know, uh, our main rival were the Lost Yetis, because they were put together pretty much around the same time. And, you know, we wanted to beat them. We, if we were going up together the same night, we wanted to be better than them. Uh, we wanted to be better than everyone we, we, uh, we, we, were, we went up against. Um, so we rehearsed every week, and we and we uh, and we cared so much about succeeding as, as a group that uh, everyone just tried harder. I mean, I tried to be the. I mean, this is a little bit selfish, but I tried to be the best person on Frank Booth, who would, who would be the best team at I.O. and then blah 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 blah, <laughs> and whatever the motivation I had. Uh, everyone on the team had that, which uh, which is rare. Um, we had to fight tooth and nails to stay together, and I, 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 I think you mentioned that. Yeah, well, like the first year, like every schedule, everyone was convinced that the team would be broken up, and somehow we just hung on, hung on. by a thread. Uh, but I think it was good because, like, after a year, suddenly Sharna came to one show, and it's like, wow, Frank Booth, your house team. But she, uh, she really meant it. Uh, oh, thank you. And I thought it was. Uh, you said when you took Miles' class that you and Steve would like drill each other? Yeah, Miles was teaching level two, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he was teaching the game. He were taught the game of scene work, how to find the game. Uh, basically, off of the first line of dialogue, you can find that the correct response, you've got a game right there. First line, second line, your game is established. Um, and we were going through this in class. Uh, time after time, you'd, you'd give the first line, and Miles would make you stop. Think about it, what was said in that first line. Now, what sort of response starts a pattern of, of, of frustration, mostly, in this exercise? Uh, after working through that, Steve, Muscetta, uh and I, who were in the same class, would sit and drill each other at the Wrigley side. I'd give him a line, and he would try to think of the, <laughs> the line right after he said of the game, and he would give me one, and I'd like, okay. Yeah, and we would do that for like an hour over drinks, just trying to find the game of the scene from the first line, second line. Miles would just be at the end of the bar like that. <laughs> 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 
I haven't talked to Miles until I was here for five years. <laughs>
you know, funny, it was funny. We, we did improv stuff in, in a playing area, as Bob Holland does here. And, uh, and we just felt really good about our work <clears throat> because we were, we were just sincere about uh, the improv. And it wasn't exactly comedy based. It was more character based. And yes, that, that will lead to comedy, but we didn't really want to be as funny as possible. We wanted to be as interesting as possible. Um, I tell some of the teams that I've coached before, sometimes Frank Booth shows there'd be no huge laughter during it, but afterwards there was people would yell out booth and there would be like a very nice applause that they appreciated our show. And that was enough for us. We didn't care about laughs during the we wanted them to enjoy our show as a whole afterwards. And Blue Metal Lounge really sort of fed into that um, that sort of idea of just remain silent until the show is over. It brought Improv closer to theater, which is where I think improv can go to make it, to bring it up to, the, to a higher level. Because people would think that it was scripted, which is nice. And uh, a few people have come up and told us the first show they saw, I oh, know, maybe you want to go here. And uh, since I felt that way with Three Man Rituals, I, uh, I, that always strikes me as a very, very nice compliment to the people who say that. Um, because I think we, because we, because we deserve it. We did a lot, of, we did a lot of kick-ass work, and uh, and we were all, you know, we all had such a great time. The team was so, so committed to each other. That's why we stayed together for four years, and you know, we've been through marriages and such. <coughs> and you took uh, took that group to Edinburgh a couple times, also. Yeah, we uh, with the, that first year in '95 when Chicago invaded uh, Edinburgh with our improv and our crazy Chicago comedy. Uh, we went over there and did an improv show uh, called Harold on the Hollywood, which is the street that our theater was on. And, uh, and that was great. Three weeks in Edinburgh, Scotland. I had never traveled overseas before. It was, you got to go, this is your one time you're going to go. Uh, I've been back since. But uh, uh, we took our improv to, uh, to Scotland and lived there for three weeks, did a show every night, except for a couple nights. And uh, we got some pretty good reviews, some pretty good houses. The improv was fun. They got it. And it was just uh, a very exciting time for, uh, for our team. What do you remember about first doing the Armando show? <laughs> it sucked in it. Uh, I, uh, the first Armando I did was not here in this space. We did a benefit at the Damon, which is a bar on Damon and uh, Roscoe. And uh, I remember very little of it. Uh, I remember going out there, and Neil Flynn was Armando talking about musicals and stuff. And I started out, initiated the scene with E.J. Peters, and I was singing some song for the Music Man, and had nothing else after it. And uh, I finished on the verse, and I was like, "Let's do it." Uh, there's nothing going on here. <laughs> and it's my fault, I think. That I don't know what to say. And I'm nervous about my own ability. And so after the seventh Armando, I wasn't nervous about my own ability, and I kind of got out there and felt a little more comfortable. Um, the thing is, I had watched Armando. Most of my, most of my learning, not most, a lot of my learning came from watching Armando and watching other teams and seeing how they do it. And if teams aren't as good as Armando, I was correcting them as I'm watching them and wondering what I would do instead. But if I wanted to learn about initiation lines, if I wanted to learn when to walk on or when to edit, I would watch Armando and watch how they do it, and they would do it right, or they would do it as, as I would now do it, um, hopefully. And walking out to that stage and being in that show, I'm uh, like, I gotta, I gotta do new stuff. I gotta make sure that what I do is, is what people would want to do if they could do it. And um, my meager talents just won't cut it. So I've got to step it up a notch, and as soon as I got into my head about that, I started to fuck up. And uh, so I just sort of relaxed and, and, and did what I like to do um, through a few drunken proddings from Noah, saying, you can just do it. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> I will. And, uh, and it got easier, but only after like the seventh time I did it. I mean, it's just, after watching it for so long, you're up there across from Mick, who I don't know, and, or I didn't know, and didn't improvise with, and messing, and Brian Stack was there going to these people, you can't improvise with people you just adore and, and think you're, you're a world away as far as talent. It's so hard to do it. Um, but after a while, you know, as you make these people you admire laugh, you're like, okay, all right, I, I, okay. 
Good enough. <laughs> Just barely good enough. Uh, who are some of the improvisers who uh, influenced you, or uh, or even people like now? Uh, influenced me. Uh, Dave Keckner was the first. His character work was uh, was connected, and not he doesn't just throw in a voice. He assumes a character with a definite character attitude and carries it throughout the scene while being funny. Uh, Brian Stack, because he can say one line and crack up an entire room and then not speak for the entire scene and then close the scene with another line. Uh, <laughs> that would just, that would just burn the room down. Um, and, uh, watching, and, and watching Miles, actually, with uh, uh, giving shit if I have. But uh, his his speed and his his uh, his quick pickup of of game and of repetition and of callback. He's who I looked at most in that regard. Uh, character work, Keckner, uh, saying something perfect for the moment. Brian Stack. Um, <coughs> people who I like to watch now. I like to watch Jack McBrayer a lot right now. If you know Jack's work at ETC, I go see him. Um, I uh, I enjoy watching Stephanie Weir so much. She played a couple weeks ago here in Armando, and I, I definitely just found myself just like, I, you know, I don't care about edits, I don't care about what I'm doing in the show. I'm watching this really, really connected person do some great character and really, really funny work. Um, and that's about it. I hate pretty much everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Stephanie are good. Yeah, they're good. Okay, they're good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, what's the best quality for an improviser to have? What's, uh... Humility and patience. Um, I'm a pretty humble guy. Uh, and uh, I think it, it, I think remaining quiet and, and waiting and not forcing uh, is, a, is a key to good improv. Cause I mean, do I say that because that's the person I am? Uh, probably. Um, but I, I remember uh, some time in my improv life where I try to go out there as much as possible and I try to say the funny thing, uh, try to be funny, try to make people laugh. And, uh, and you'd fail, and I would fail and fail and fail and fail and sometimes hit, but mostly fail. And uh, when I realized more along the lines of just, just be patient in scene work. Start it off normal. Uh, let the scene build. Let let people, let the audience be lulled into a certain area. And then after that, you can, excuse me, try to say something uh, amusing or something quirky. And it has much. Uh, it's easier and has a greater effect. What's the uh, bad qualities for? Um, bad qualities for improvisers to have. Um, uh, Other than hubris and impatience. <laughs> <laughs> I think improvisers who go at their work with the sense of, um, this will be really funny, this will be funny, uh, hey, I'm going to do this, this will be funny. Uh, or uh, improvisers who are are trying improvisers who try as to respond as quickly as possible uh, to a line that's been said to them to show how quick they can be. The improvisers who think quickness is uh, a, a great aspect of improv, uh, I think, are going at it from a completely different, uh, completely, completely wrong point of view. I'll say wrong point of view because um, sometimes it's not about quickness, and if if it does get quick. It, it's building from a slow point. Slow is always the start. Um, and professors who try at any cost to say something funny instead of something appropriate. Okay. You're starting a scene. What, uh, what, are, you, what are you thinking in the early moments of the scene? What's your uh, I'm thinking inner dialogue? My inner dialogue is, uh, uh. where are we? And um, what is my scene partner trying to do? I know what I'm trying to do, and I know who I am. Uh, but uh, first off, where are we so we don't stand in the center of the stage? And secondly, what is my scene partner trying to do? Because their idea is better than mine, and I want to help their idea. You always think that your scene partner has a better idea? Not always, but uh, but the uh, but the idea of 
we can make, I can make this improv scene work, and it's more fun and more challenging to me to make their idea work when I walk on stage with them than my own. I always had my idea in a case, and if their idea <laughs> or I, I miss their idea, or uh, or uh, I think I can weasel my idea in with their idea. I go ahead and do that. But I really, what I really enjoy is making someone else's idea work, or at least the idea of I know what you want in the scene, and now I have the choice of to, fr to frustrate you, to give you what you want or to say with my eyes, I know what you want, you're not going to get it until we come back in 20 minutes or so, or whatever. What's, uh, you've been teaching and coaching here for quite some time also. What are your philosophies behind teaching? What do you try to, other than things you've already spoken to yeah. tonight, what, um, what, uh, what do you try to impart to your students? I try to impart uh, this sort of lens into what I've already talked about, but I, uh, to uh, letting things, uh, taking the time in scene work to let lines affect you. Um, to hear a line, think about what that line means to you, and then respond. So there's like silence in between the line and the response. There's you know, <coughs> any, any amount of two to five seconds of sort of like, hmm, I, I, I care about what you said and I want it. And I want to use your, uh, use your, I try to teach to use your other improvisers' lines in your own, in your own idea. Uh, that way no one's playwriting there or uh, one idea isn't beating down someone's idea so the other person can't breathe in the scene. Um, to give that time in between improv lines where you A, completely hear what's been said to you, throw off that first crappy funny idea and go with the second idea which is a line that supports and uses what's been said to you as well. Um, I, like, I do like to teach patience and, and re reality at the start. Um, my classes have heard this. I did a workshop a few years ago with uh, Amy, and Matt, Amy Polar and Matt Besser who came back and they said, like, the beginning of the scene is uh, you're standing in a limpid pool, and uh, the water's completely still. And at some point, someone makes a move, and there's a little ripple. They make a tiny little move, and there's a ripple, and everyone sees that ripple. So, so jump on it. Just, it's so easy to see the little weirdness that just happened when everything's starting off in, in like, calm water. So you start a scene, and, hey, Daddy, my ass is on fire, and you're splashing around this pool, you can't see any sort of little thing to focus on because everything's so large. So I'm a huge proponent of uh, staying calm at the start of scenes and playing realistic until something weird happens or something weird has been said. Uh, it will stand out, you know, like a pimple on a nose and, uh, and both improvisers will see it so they know what to, what to focus on. What would uh, Paul, the teacher, say to Paul, the performer? What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not with that in mind, but just what, what, do you, what do you feel are your strengths and weaknesses as a performer? Uh, um, good realistic scene work, Paul. You, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, uh, uh, I don't know, you, you have a tendency to you sort of walk into scenes a little bit, um, but you're always doing it for, to support the environment. Uh, sometimes it's just a little bit too much, actually, you know, so we don't need it. Um, or, uh, um, oh, that's a really hard question. I can't, I'd, I'd love for someone else to answer that. I'd love for you to answer that, Greg. Well, if I, I were to give you a note about uh, <laughs> about the best thing that you do, the best thing to watch Paul Grandi for, I think, is like uh, emotional commitment in a scene and just making a choice emotionally. None of his characters are ever apathetic about anything. If you walk into a scene and tell Paul something, he'll immediately be like, Go! Go! What? Really? <laughs> Uh, like he'll make an emotional choice like that, but it's always believable, and it's always something to uh, to start with. And, and a lot of people, 
uh, you see them just trying to play the scene at arm's length, trying to be very cool about things, be very cerebral about things, and his characters are always very, very involved in what's going on. Great, and now a bad one? Um, I'm serious, I got it. I would love to hear it. Uh, <laughs> being too hesitant. Except emotionally. <laughs> scenes I was in, but I feel like I wasn't done yet, or like my scenes weren't done yet, not because I was edited quickly, but I, I take, I think I take a while to sort of, to rev up when it comes to scene work. I, I can't, I don't think I can have that, that quick, let's get to it, and let's start, and we got a pattern already, we've got a game to our scene. And then we play it, play it, play it, play it, and then we're edited. I, I haven't been in the scene like that in years, and I don't know. I think that's right where the hesitancy that you mentioned, because I feel that. I'm like, let's just get to it, Grandi. Stop being somebody and just start speaking and, 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 and run a little bit, which I, which I don't do, which I, I don't run. Um, I, I think I can run. Uh, when I'm sitting on the side, I definitely can run, but when I'm in, I can't run. Uh, I want to be in every scene. That's how much I want to run. But uh, but I, I I'm hesitant about that because it doesn't seem real to me. I guess. I think for your walk-ons, if you sat on the side and thought in every scene, if I were to do something to heighten this scene or to heighten one of these characters, what would I do? Right. And then act on about a third of those impulses. You know. That's basically about. what I do. I mean. Yeah. Well, tonight, then you go fine. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Tonight I just couldn't I couldn't stay still. As soon as Noah was lying on the on something as a as a working at the music store, I'm like I got it I got it. He's a he's a lazy employee. He's some somebody famous. And I couldn't get the word Hitler out of my head. <laughs> and I'm like it's got to be somebody else. And, you know, was, well, I'm sitting Christina's in the back. I'm like, I got something. I don't know if it'll fly. Because <laughs> when you mention Hitler, you're like. Um, so I called Hitler, and a few people got it. And then when you came in, called back to what to the whole Einstein thing, that made me feel so much better. Uh, that's one thing about Armando. In the first few times, I would initiate and do a scene of complete crap. And later on in the show, someone would refer to my scene to help their other scene. And I'd be like, thank you. You gave that piece of shit scene a little bit of validation. It caused at least that one line in your scene later on. Thank you, Mr. Kepner. Thank you, Mr. I can't do it myself, but if you help me, then I, I feel better and look better to an audience. Yes. What would you like to see the current generation of advisors work on? You have, have a new generation coming into your class every eight weeks. What do you see as overriding problems, either with improv or um, the way they approach the work or what have you? They, uh, the people coming in now, are are too advanced they, for for my for my level and for improv at their at their point of view and at their point in, in their career. I would love to see people who realize that really learning improv is going to take you four years from the, from from the day you start to the day that you have got it all or you think that you you're confident enough to do any show anywhere at any time. You know, what, what game is this? Okay, let's go. You know, that kind of stuff um, takes a long time. And even if you have the ability, you still take that time to make sure you're open enough to learn everything before you close your mind off and go, I've already got it. You know, too early, most of the, a lot of the students here from the shows I see, or at least from the students I've had, most of them, it seems that most of them feel like they've got it. You know, they've got it. They've got it. They, they don't need to, you know, expand themselves anymore because they have the core of it and they, can, and they can do the job and they can make people laugh so they're done. Um, I believe that is, a, that is an incorrect mindset as well. They, it, even if, no matter how good you are, like I wanted to come in here and start at level three with Dell because I had a whole year in Second City. <laughs> Come on, I've been doing it for a year. I know what's going on. 
Uh, give me Phil. Uh, uh, and then when I got to Thomas Fox. So uh, um, it takes time. Give it that time because if you don't, you're diminishing you're diminishing what it is and how how beautiful and difficult it can be. Um, it would, it's a discipline. And all that that word entails. Yes, I agree. Uh, the journey is its own reward. Um, I take things very slow. I'm a procrastinator. I, uh, <laughs> my career isn't shooting off, you know, like that. But that's okay with me because everything takes time, and everything will come in its time. So don't force it, because then you look like someone who's trying to really force it, you know. I, uh, I don't mind people coming up to me and introducing themselves, but I'm not that. I know. I can't wait to be famous, and I can't. I can't wait to to be known all across Chicago with, with my improv stuff. Um, I mean, like I said, I haven't talked to Miles. And I didn't talk to Miles for five years. I didn't talk to like anyone because I, I'm not. I'm not about like knowing people. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Hey, I'm Paul Graham. Hey, you. <laughs> I do uh, Just, t just. I want everyone in 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 in, in improv right now to realize that they've got years to go before they are as good an improviser as they think they are. We're going to do uh, some audience Q and A in just a minute, but first I'd like to uh, ask Paul the uh, questions that were first done by Bernard Pivot on his show All de Couture. Um, <laughs> Paul, what is your favorite word? <laughs> uh, my favorite word would be the only word that's coming to mind right now. So I'll answer is love. Love. What is your least favorite? Word? <laughs> my least favorite word. Uh, uh, I think I'm stealing this, but uh, cancer. What job or occupation would you most want to have? Job or occupation I would want to have is uh, probably a second baseman. <laughs> <laughs> we need one. Yeah, but. A bit more danger. Yeah. Who's the, oh, then we got in the guy from yeah, LA so. Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gary Young. Um, so sorry. Um, <laughs> what uh, what job or occupation would you least like to have? Retail assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know what? It's actually restaurant manager. I'm a waiter right now, and restaurant managers just have like 60 hour weeks, and that's uh, awful. Yeah. Awful. They're miserable people. They're miserable people. Uh, <laughs> what sound or noise do you hear? <coughs> sound or noise do I love? Answer. Silence. What sound or noise do you hate? <coughs> Machine that takes lug nuts off the tires. <laughs> Sounds like. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> Jag off. <laughs> if heaven exists, what do you hope to hear God say when you arrive? <laughs> um, uh, here's an here's an infinite amount of quarters, and we have tempest. <laughs> shooting down to the center as these things come up to you. You spin around, and you shoot down the center, you go back and forth. <laughs> All right. Uh, Christina? I, you got just right, right up for your performance in Catch Me in the Cat Air show. Uh, and that air? No. <laughs> Months ago. Do you miss doing uh, scripted work, and are you looking forward to doing that? Is that part of like what? Yeah. Um, I've done some plays since I've started improvising. Um, I did Catch Me If You Can just recently, the stage left, which was really great. And uh, I did a show in Franklin Park at the Circuit Theater called uh, All in the Timing, which was just, oh, I loved it so much. And 
Yes, I was. I would tell people afterwards if they're asked about it that uh, sometimes theater is is uh, more fulfilling than improv. Um, feeling good about a performance after a play uh, fills me with more with a, with a higher sense of accomplishment than pulling off some good improv uh, uh, on these stages here uh, because it's someone else's idea and it's like that sense of making the scene work with someone else's idea. Uh, really sort of nailing uh, a, bit of, a bit of work that someone else wrote that you have to do night after night and one night can be really crappy and the next night, same words, same, same people who are around you, same audience as far as I know, uh, and doing it, doing it, Doing it really, I mean, not great, doing it great. Not that I was great, but feeling that this feeling is great. That I am really feeling very good that I'm working with someone else's stuff. There's parameters, there's limitations, there's definite things to say, definite times. And when the performances are good, you're feeling fresh as you're delivering lines and stuff like that. And for some reason, at the eighth performance, your timing is, 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 is right there on lines that maybe weren't there like last week. And it just seems like a job well done, which which is a, which makes me feel great with uh, with the follow. Yeah, the follow. <laughs> a lot of people in that in that cast uh, are were improvisers. Mm -hmm. Did you do you feel differently putting up a scripted show with people who know how to improvise as opposed to people like from your theater program or just theater? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I I think sometimes. Uh, it's, it's a two-way street. Uh, improv being a great, being, <laughs> strike that. Being, uh, being an improviser, uh, I feel makes you a better actor. You, uh, you imagine, it's easier to imagine the life of, of a character that you do in a play when you're an improviser. Because when you play a character on stage, if you're doing it my way, uh, you are discovering the, the whole life of this character as you're presenting them on stage. Um, improvisers can do that to their theater characters in an instant without being asked to do it. Uh, sometimes if, uh, if some, uh, some actors just get so en engrossed in, in, in a character and what they mean for the play that they don't seem real enough. The characters that they, that they, that they portray in their plays aren't as connected sometimes to reality, uh, where some of the improvisers, if they're playing uh, uh, a character in, in, a, in a play, uh, their performance seems much more real and, 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 and their characters seem a little more believable. Um, this isn't true across the board because great actors can, can make you believe who they are in an instant. Um, and some improvisers think they can act, and they can't. Uh, uh, I've never seen a play where I've seen an actor go, I've seen an actor go, oh, that actor is probably an improviser because they're blowing it off. I mean, every sh few shows I've done where the actors have had improv experience, uh, they, they pull it off all right. They don't seem fake. The, the, the bad stuff about improv is carry over to their acting. Uh, the good stuff of their improv carries over to their acting. And, uh, Improvising is a great tool in the rehearsal process, as a theater piece of itself, um, and to and to increase your awareness of who you really are when you assume a character from a play. I think. One good question. Sure. I, I just have a question. In your opinion, you said that Frank was successful because you were turning into each other in the first every week together. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, because this didn't exist back then, and now teams are here, they're at the playground, they're basically at the noise, they're doing a show for the town. So they can't make all their rehearsals. So I'm wondering what you, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that affects things? How do you think that Definitely. affects uh, teams today? Yeah. Uh, Chicago is producing fantastic individual improvisers. When we were going through auditions for the road show, uh, there are any number of people who, who can do it because individually they have the skills, they got the chops to do the improv, have to do anything, they'll pull it off. The teams, however, I mean, improv is, is a group, is a group form. Uh, you can't improvise by yourself. You need at least one person up there with you. Uh, the group, the stronger the group, 
the, uh, the more chances to produce fantastic pieces, theater pieces. Uh, the good shows I see down here, uh, up here or downstairs, uh, everyone on the, in the group is together and they're making the moves that everyone's like, yeah, I'm just going to make that same move. Um, uh, after a while on Friday Booth, uh, this happened a couple times with you, Lillian Francis, uh, we would be out there together and we'd say our each other's lines and our eyes would light up because we exactly had, we had the same exact idea at the same time with the exact same person in mind to stand across from. Um, that, that only comes from, from a true group ensemble. That only comes from a true group, a true ensemble. Um, even some, even our, Armando isn't nearly as, as much of a group as, as my team was. And if the Armando work suffers a little bit, it's because we are mostly individuals coming together to try to produce a form. Uh, if you've got a group together and you care about each other enough, and you care about the work enough to do the, to do the best as a group, it's got to be, it's almost got, it, it has to be your sole commitment, or at least one or two. Uh, everyone who plays in a bunch of different places is, is advancing individually, but isn't improv a form where you have to do it with other people? So if you're advancing individually, how does, how does that help you when you do improv? Because, you know, if you're the greatest improviser in the world and you're across from someone who hasn't as much stage time as you, it's almost like, I'm the better one, so I'm, I will take control. Your idea is, yes, but justified away, and my idea, my idea will live. And um, <laughs> because I've had the more experience, and, and you know, that sort of idea can, can fester a little bit on groups when, really, you like your playground group more than your I.O. group. I mean, you'll do I.O. because you want to be seen, you want to be on stage all the time. Uh, so you, want, you don't want to throw away your I.O. group, or you don't want to throw away your playground group, but if you're, you know, if your uh, devotions are split like that, your, the, the, the teams that you're on will suffer because of it. There were a few people on, on French Booth who had other things going on, and they didn't stay on French Booth. I mean, uh, because the eight of us, or seven, how many of you it ended up, ended up being eight people. Eight people uh, stayed with it from day one. And anyone who sort of came into the came into the four and uh, didn't have the dedication we had left the group. There were a few people. I mean, and then one of those like mainstay people had like something going on. It would be like an extended leave of absence. It's like, well, goodbye for the next three months. Yeah, you know, we'll see you when you get back. Yeah, you know? I mean, hey. rather than oh hey, you're here to do the show. Great. Right. Thanks. <laughs> you know, we will like, see you in two That weeks. person would be gone. That person would not do the show. That person would be like, you can sit and watch because. <clears throat> It's a form, it's yeah. a group. So if you're on a team and somebody is only showing up for like the shows, you don't have to put up with it. Yeah, they're full of shit, um, actually. It's awful. Liz. Hi, uh, Hi. I have a question. Uh, sure, Liz, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> What's your view on teams rehearsing, like normal rehearsal time, 7 to 10, and let's say they play Monopoly or watch a movie together. What's your view on, uh, on spending rehearsal time? That's great. That's great. you got to do that. you gotta, you got to be friends with your team. I mean, every team, I don't know, not every, teams, teams should not click off, like, like, I, like, these four people are really, really close friends, but the other four people on their team just aren't included in their fun. Um, it's, I'm not saying you have to hang out with each other 24-7, but you have to be comfortable enough with each other, and you have, and you take that time, you walk, you go to a bar together, you just, even in places of rehearsal, get together, I, I, I don't know if I've, I've done this maybe once or twice only. Um, like, okay, instead of rehearsal, we're all gonna, you know, smoke a joint. We're all gonna, <laughs> we're all gonna go to the bar. Um, and just find out who, who we are personally. Because it, cause it helps. Specifically, it helps. how does Monopoly help, though? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Monopoly helps because the winner of Monopoly is the best person on your earth, <laughs> Any questions from any students? Martin? Um, yes, Paul. Um, have you ever uh, 
thought of or done any like other media work like TV or film or what do you feel about like improvisers going on to that? It's all great. It's all great. Uh, improvisers can, I think, make the best auditioners for stuff like that. Um, I, uh, improv can be used in any facet, in any sort of, uh, in any sort of media, in any sort of create. Anything that you have to do that takes a bit of creativity, uh, improvising will help because it opens those doors of perception. It opens that creativity. Um, I have done no move. I've done one student film and uh, had a terrible time on it. I uh, have done a couple commercials and had a great time on it just because I knew the paycheck was coming. Uh, <laughs> but the but the improv but the but the impro it uh, it, it sort of buoys you up a little bit, knowing that whatever happens to you, whatever someone has said to you, you are calm and cool enough to have a response to it that you don't like go back and go, mm, I shouldn't have said that. You know, that was dumb. Uh, I think it, I mean, I haven't done it, but improv works everywhere. <coughs> Business, you know, movies, commercials, writing, uh, consulting, you know, anytime you have to talk to if you're in a job where you have to talk to people, take an improv class because it'll it'll it's better than any sort of imagination of anyone in their underwear. So, you know, is that cool. an answer? Martin, pretty much. Let's do one more. Okay. Oh, I uh, would do the joke question last. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
And um, we, would, we would talk as openly as possible, and we would try to get the audience to, to talk as openly as possible about their concerns and their, and their worries, and we would base their troubles on, uh, we would base our scene work on their troubles. And if they had some concern, we would make fun of them on stage and make fun of their troubles and uh, try to sort of answer them at the same time, which Miles participated in and directed in as, I guess, yeah, Frank Moon's last, last hurrah. Or gas. Or last gas. And who was the director of that again? <laughs> <laughs> three, three times. Did you say that? I would have brought it up. <laughs> I would have brought it up had you mentioned it in your pre-interview, but you didn't. So we had a really cool post for a fat guy with his pants hanging down. Um, and you would beat no. each other with the phone bag. Yeah, if someone said something we didn't like, we had the we'd be like, "You're lying, boom," or "You're bullshitting," and we'd hit him in the head. Uh, it was uh, it was just more of a show that, like Blue Velvet Lounge, that sort of like just said, screw any sort of theatrical fakeness or uh, assumed sort of character like this is somebody. We were ourselves, dressed as ourselves, and trying to get in the audience to be themselves and to talk as openly as possible. And it's just another form that used something else as an opening. Thank Paul Brownie for talking as openly. <laughs> I believe. So please uh, come and see that. Thank you so much. Thank you.